Today, a confession. How I was literally eating and drinking myself to death. Get that <laughs> crack out of your life. You have legacies to build. We grew that business from 3.4 million to 17.1. Horsepower, not horse shit. You want to be the parent that's an ally. They don't need another friend. Not everybody's cup of whiskey. Toughest advice for the toughest businessmen. Be relentless. Back in April 2018, we lost our fourth consecutive uh, league final. This was actually a semifinal to the perennial champion Castleman Vikings. That was their fourth straight uh, league championship. I owned the Perth Blue Wings. We were the top two franchises in the entire league. And they had finished, uh, they had finished with four consecutive championships, including 2018. We were regular season champions four straight years that I was coaching, but we had finished second place every single year, four straight times. In, uh, in April 2018, we were up in the series against Castleman three games to one and we hit the crossbar to win the series in game six in the Perth Arena. Sold out, packed. Joey Laird hits the crossbar, one of my best players. That would have been our first Barkley Cup championship. That would have ended the Castleman Vikings four year reign as league champions and we would have achieved the championship that we had been pursuing for the last four to five years. That series went on after we hit the crossbar. We lost that game, game six in double overtime. And then we went back to Castleman the next night and we lost a very tight game in game seven. And I will always remember that long drive home from Castleman to Perth I remember the absolute stunning silence in the locker room. I remember collecting myself and addressing myself and addressing the team. Remember that team was graduating. 50% of the players were aging out. You can play to age 21. So a lot of tears in that dressing room, a lot of scathing disappointment, a lot of a lot of sick to your stomach mentality, but still not enough to get the job done. And that was one of the longest rides of my life. I remember it. I remember the, the solitude. I remember the, how dark, dark the ride was. It was late at night, but I just remember that feeling of literally being physically ill, being physically ill from losing for the fourth year in a row, right at the doorstep of a championship. Four years of extreme hard work, four years of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, thousands and thousands of years invested coaching, assistant coaches, video, Mark Andre, my business partner, working tirelessly to give us an edge and after it all, and that ride home, nothing to show for it, but a second place banner. And it literally made my stomach turn to stand there on the ice for the fourth consecutive year and watch the Castleman Vikings skate around and celebrate, deservedly so, with that Barkley Cup over their heads. The place was packed. They were celebrating their fourth straight championship and they had exactly what we wanted. Almost unbearable mentally and physically. And in the other years before that, when we had lost the three previous years, I always used that sick to my stomach, watching them celebrate, uh, you know, using the pain of the losses for fuel and gasoline. Within two days, I was back at it, recruiting, getting ready for the next season, you know, talking to Mark Andre, talking to my assistant coaches, talking to the trainer, and getting ready to load up another team 
for another quest for a championship. Just keep knocking at the door. Keep working to, to achieve that to achieve that grand championship. But this fourth consecutive loss was entirely different. I didn't recover from it uh, in 24 or 48 hours. I was beyond, beyond lost after that game. We guess it was the fact that we had a 3-1 series lead. But I literally returned home. And for the next seven or eight days, I never left our home. I never went out in the community. I never went out and, you know, grabbed a lunch at Subway. I never went to the local pub for... I never met my dad for lunch. I I didn't go in. I didn't go do any work. I didn't go to any Rotary Club meetings. I literally... I literally locked myself away in our basement. And we have this huge basement with a uh, with a, a huge bar and a pool snooker table at the time and a TV in a bedroom. And I literally sequestered myself. I literally went off grid for eight days and it certainly wasn't on purpose. I didn't talk to anybody. I didn't phone anybody. The only people really that knew that I were I was there would have been my my wife Krista and uh, uh, that's about it maybe my mom and dad knew where I was but they didn't know they knew that they hadn't seen me since since game seven so um, certainly uh, the lowest point hello. hello good luck my secret weapon heading to the physiotherapist this morning a good friend of mine to get a rib injury fixed and uh, get her back to 100%. So it was uh, it was the lowest point in 22 years of coaching hockey pro and amateur. And for the for that one week, for that 10 days, uh, eight days, whatever it was, I literally was eating and drinking myself to death. I was down in the basement, and I would sit there, and I was watching Sports Center. I was watching movies. Uh, I was watching, you know, I don't know what, YouTube videos. But most of the time I was just thinking. I was just there licking my wounds and, you know, trying. I don't even know if I was trying to get myself out of the hole of an unhappiness that I was in. I would never experienced anything like the low of that loss professionally. It's not the same as, I knew it wasn't the same as losing a loved one or losing a parent or losing a child or anything important like that. But a literal sick to your stomach feeling that all your work for four years has really counted for almost nothing. So I didn't rebound this time. I'm a rebounder. I didn't rebound this time. And I sat in that basement for eight days and I ate and drank myself, um, I was like a man on a mission to eat and drink myself to death. Uh, the place was full of pizza boxes and the TV room, takeout food, um, you know, beer bottles, uh, whatever. And I would shoot pool, shoot some snooker, watch some TV, have a nap. That was it. I didn't communicate with anybody. I didn't call my coaches. I didn't talk to any of my players. I didn't plan the year-end banquet, which I'd always be doing. I didn't talk to my marketing director. I didn't talk to Mark Andre. I just stayed in the basement and felt sorry for myself for eight days. I literally, I literally was consumed, um, you know, by feeling sorry for myself and the and the fact that I had lost another game seven. So I'll never forget the day my wife, Krista, it was after eight days of eating and drinking myself to death in the in the basement my wife came down and she had given me my space she knows she knows me better than anybody she knows when to listen she knows when to talk she knows when to push she knows when to give space but she had had enough after six or seven or eight days and she walked down the steps and she said your dad wants to see you at the office and I had sold McLean Insurance in 2017. I still own the building. But my dad had remained on for two and a half years. So he was still working there with the commercial clients. So my dad's still at his same office. He worked there every single day. 
Like my dad was like, he was 84 at the time. And Krista came down, she said, she goes, your dad wants to see you at the office right now. I was like, right now? So after some, uh, after I talked to her a little bit, I, I went upstairs and I showered and I shaved uh, probably the first time in, in a week. And I got myself together and I got, uh, I put on some clothes and I headed over to the office and I'll always remember walking in the, uh, in my dad's office, his head down. He was working with pen and paper, um, as he always was, nine to five, just solid, no breaks, just work when you work, uh, relax when you relax. And I walked in, I sat down and he's like, he said to me, he goes, where the fuck have you been? And I knew he knew the answer because I, I know that Krista was the one that called him and she told him what had been happening, what I was doing. So I said, well, I said, I've just been at home thinking, going through different scenarios and trying to make a decision whether I'm done or not, whether uh, I'm gonna sell the team, um, the mission hasn't worked out, and I'm just trying to decide whether I have what it takes anymore to, to, to do this or, I'm leaning towards retiring and I'm leaning towards sell, selling the team. And as, I, as I've told people before, my dad, he looked up from his paper only the way he can. He said, what's the matter? You got nothing left? And I sat there in the chair and I thought about it for a second. It made me angry. It made me uncomfortable. It made me rage inside. It made me frustrated for a few seconds. It made me disappointed and angry and sad all at the same time. And then I turned to him and I said, I have lots left, thank you very much. And he said, well, a man who goes home and hides in his basement and, and eats and drinks himself to, to death, he says, doesn't really doesn't really strike me as the type of leader that has anything left. He says, if you don't have anything left, make that decision today, put the team up for sale, don't coach. He says, this is, a, this is the, uh, the pinnacle franchise of this entire league. Um, this is the, uh, the New York Yankees of junior hockey. This is the Dallas Cowboys of the, uh, of the NFL. If you're not going to be all in, then be all out. So I, uh, I actually, that was it. I, uh, I walked out of that, that office. I didn't, I didn't say anything and I went home and I went back down to the basement, but this time I wasn't eating and I did, wasn't drinking and I wasn't watching TV. And I sat on the couch in, uh, in my home office and in total silence, I just sat there for five hours and thought about my next move. First of all, I thought about whether I had, did I have the fuel, did I have the gasoline to chase another championship? Um, what were the pros and cons? What, what would happen if I did win? What would happen if we, if we lost again? You know, where would my life be? How would this affect me? How would this affect my wife? How would this affect my young daughter? How would this affect, you know, people in the community? If I sold the team, what are the pros and cons? Who would I sell it to? what would happen to the franchise. And after five hours of sitting there in absolute solitude, I just literally came to life like I normally do a few days after a loss. I literally came back more determined than ever before. And before I left the office that day, my dad said to me, he said, and it upset me for a while until I sucked it up and manned up and stopped making excuses for myself and stopped feeling sorry for myself and stopped sedating and stopped medicating myself with food and booze. He said to me, he goes, you're the problem. I'm sitting across from a man, I've just lost my fourth consecutive championship to the same franchise that nobody's been able to beat. I've done everything I can. I put in $400,000 that year into that team hired the best coaches, the best trainers, the best video people. I've run it like a pro, pro organization, like a family. And he looks at me and he says, 
you are the problem. A team that I put before my family, put before my wife, uh, that I literally bleed blue and white. You're the problem. You're the reason you didn't win. And he looks in and he makes it worse. He said, he goes, and nothing will change until you do. You'll lose again next year. If you come back, if you have the guts to come back and lead this team, you will lose again to Castleman next year. No matter how much I cheer or how much money you spend or how much time you put in or how great the players are or how hard you recruit, you're the problem and nothing will change until you do. So I was in, I sat there in stunned silence. He said, like all great leaders, he said, the good news is you're also the solution. Now, I didn't find that to be very, very, very good news because I was kind of like, okay, I'm the problem. I'm the reason we're losing. And yes, we're going to lose again unless I change. So I really didn't see the sunrise or the sunset in, oh, I, if, if, I'm also the solution. He says, you know why you've lost four consecutive championships to, to that team? Do you know why you've been unable to put a championship ring on your finger in four tries? No matter how much money you invest, no matter how much you coach, no matter all the great players you bring in, no matter how much you know you invest and, and, and put into this team. And my dad went to every game, of course, right? He saw two, he goes, I saw two very different teams on the ice four straight years. He goes, you have a plan B. I said, of course I have a plan B. I have a plan B in business. I have two laptops. I have two homes. I have two printers. I have two scanners. I have two employees. I have two funnels. I have two books. I have two ways of generating money. I have two homes. I have two vehicles. No, Dan Kennedy taught me that one is the most dangerous um, number in business. So yes, I do have a plan B. He said, that's great. That's great for your life and for business, for insurance and business. That's great. You have a great, you, that's, that's intelligent and that's responsible. You have a plan B. But he said in the law of the jungle, where you are in sports, the law of the jungle, when you're taking on ferocious competitors like the Castleman Vikings that will do almost anything to win, they're the Patriots. They're, um, they're Alabama. They're Tom Landry in Tom Landry's Dallas days. They're Bobby Knight in Bobby Knight's days. They're, uh, they're the Yankees in the Yankees days. They're Scotty Bowman winning 23 Stanley Cups, Montreal Canadiens. That's what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a ferocious, cleaner, badass, um, you know, contender, uh, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. And you have a plan B. He says, you know, the difference is I watched that team for four years defeat you. They don't have a plan B. And I was like, what do you mean they don't have a plan B? He says, I've watched you lose to them four years. They don't have a plan B. They turn over the team. They add the players. They sacrifice their future. They surrender draft picks. They surrender blue, blue chip prospects, whatever it takes for them to put the most powerful, powerful um, juggernaut team on the ice, they do that. If they have to pay a certain amount of money, if they have to sacrifice a prospect, a number one pick, to get that last player, that 21st player, that gives them the depth and the experience and the leadership to beat you, they make that trade. They do not worry about tomorrow. They do not worry about six months from now. They not, do not worry about next year. They know they'll find a way to do it again next year. My dad said, you don't have that mentality. You're always talking about next year, next year. He says, but you haven't won. So you can talk about next year all you want. He says, you'll have a competitive team. You'll have a good team. You'll have a, a, a good group of kids, but you never win with a plan B. You're competing against an enemy, opposition, competition that has burned the boats. 
you're, you're, my dad said, he goes, you're competing and trying to beat a team that has burned the ships. Every year for four straight years, they take the island. He says, you don't take the island, you have a plan B. If this all doesn't work out, somewhere deep in your subconscious, he says, you know it'll be okay because you'll be good again next year. You'll have another shot. You have a plan B. You haven't burned the ships. You haven't taken the island. Castleman takes the island. And after he told me that, he said, I was walking out and I walked by his desk and he said, do me a favor. He said, if you're going to have a plan B, he said, retire. He says, don't put me and your mother through this. Don't put us through any more second place finishes. If you're not going to burn the boats and you're not going to take the island, he said, sell the team. Give it to somebody, sell it to somebody that'll burn the boats, burn the ships and take the island. This te this community deserves a championship. They haven't won a title since, two th since uh, 1994, 24 years of the time. This from a man who's won eight, count them, eight Perth Blue Wing championships when he played. He's, he would, my dad is the first inductee into the Perth Blue Wings Hall of Fame as a player. The very first inductee into the 95-year Hall of Fame. He won eight championships. I'd won none. Burn the ships, take the island, or sell the team. Don't put us through any more of this list. Don't put us through any more second place. So I went home and I sat for five hours, as I said, and that's the kind of stuff that went through my mind. Do I have the fuel? Do I have the gasoline? Do I have the motivation to burn the ships, to, uh, to take the island, and to hell with next year? And it's interesting because after the five hours, I was all in. All in, all the way. All in, all the way. As a father, I'm all in, all the way. As a husband, I'm all in, all the way. As a businessman, I'm all in, all the way. As a community service guy in my community, I'm all in, all the way. Fitness, I'm, in, I'm all in, all the way. Not drinking alcohol, I'm all in, all the way. Reading, I'm all in, all the way. Copywriting every day, Operation Money Sucks, seven days a week all in all the way walking 15,000 steps every glorious morning all in all the way moving my life from success to significance all in all the way so now it was just a matter of taking my hockey franchise my coaching mindset and burning the ships burning the boats and taking the island no more plan b I can't win with a plan B against a competitor who has no plan B. It, it wasn't even fair. They, there was no tomorrow for that team. There was no tomorrow for that team. There was a tomorrow for our team. Things would be okay. Things would be okay if we lost. And just that little mental seed that's planted in my head, my coaches' heads, my athletes' heads, a person with no plan B will always defeat a man with a plan B. In sports, in sports, that's what I'm talking about today, in competition. So I scrapped the mentality of having a plan B, having a plan for next year, and I literally burned the boat set when I went home. And I decided we're gonna take the island. And I took that mentality into the 2018-19 season. And it really showed when I started recruiting where I started recruiting harder, more aggressively, a lot more takeaway selling, and I burned the boats when it came to recruiting. I, I, stopped, uh, I stopped, you know, asking players, and I started inviting players to join our program. I started talking about how our program probably wasn't for them, instead of selling, selling, you know, please, 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 it went to... This might not be for you. We're on a mission to win a Barkley Cup championship. This might not be for you. This is the hardest thing you'll ever do in your life. This is the most demanding experience you'll ever go through. This might not be for you. And we had our most uh, successful summer recruiting class ever. Our free agent camps, our recruiting, our protects. We literally recruited the, the, most, the, the most talented 
class we did in the first four years. All with a change in direction. This probably isn't for you. This might not be for you. If you're not going to commit 200%, if you're not about championships, then don't come here. And that reverse psychology, that takeaway selling, we, we were more successful than ever. We stopped begging for players. We stopped putting on the knee pads. And we started attracting the athletes and the people that we wanted. We started attracting, inviting. Zero neediness. Neediness was gone. Zero neediness. Oh, please come play for us was gone. It was replaced by, I don't care if you play or not. This is the best place to play. This is going to be a life-changing experience for your son. But I don't care whether you play or not. And I didn't. The other thing that was a big change was when we got down to the trade deadline and this was the difference between again winning and losing there were so many sliding door moments as the late as the great not late the great Brene Brown says sliding door moments in our lives there's a handful of sliding door moments where if it didn't happen your life would be completely different the outcome would be completely different maybe how you met your wife was a sliding door moment Maybe how you got your first job was a sliding door moment. Maybe how you, you know, stumbled onto a mentor was a sliding door moment. So Brene talks about those. A sliding door moment for us was uh, when um, the trade deadline was on, which is January 10th. That's the end. You can't make any more player transactions. So we were on our 14-day break in Florida. Every year I take my coaches to Florida we were down in Key Largo. We rented a big home on the ocean, a big $5 million home in the ocean. I fly in my coaches and their wives. They make such a sacrifice, especially the spouses. You know, I demand so much from the people around me, especially my coaches, my assistant coaches, that I flew them in. And it was, a, it was five, six days to just relax by the pool and enjoy the weather and get a break in the middle of the season and get recharged for the run to a championship. So I did that. I did that. And we had a great time. I did that for two seasons, but I did it again this season. And so the trade deadline was um, was about to happen when uh, we were down in Florida. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there with my assistant coach, Brian Greer, and he said, Coach, I think, I think we have the team this year. He says, I, we have the team this year to take Castleman down to win, to win that elusive Barkley Cup. And I'll never forget... Um, that being the scariest thing I've heard that entire season. When one of my coaches, who, I mean, he, he meant well, he believed in his heart that we had, the best, we had the team to do it. But I'd also told myself that for four previous years, we're good, and we got a shot at this. And that was my plan B mentality. That was my, um, it's okay if we don't. But it wasn't my burn the ships mentality. It wasn't my... Uh, burn the boats. I wasn't. It wasn't my new take the island. So that night, I could barely sleep. I was. I was tossing and turning. I was thinking about what my dad said. He said, "When you think you're good enough, get a lot better. When you think you're good enough, get a lot better." So I was sitting there, and I heard Brian say, "You know, we're really good. We got. We got seven good defensemen. We got four good lines. We got. We got two good goalies. We. We got it. This. This is a good team." And I was sitting there going, this is the sliding door moment for me. This is where I either man up or I accept second place. This is, whether, this is where I either man up and burn the boats, burn the ships, and take the island or we'll finish second. This is the moment my dad was, this is the sliding door moment my dad was talking about exactly. When I was moaning and crying and complaining in his office. And I remember calling our general manager, Bill White, who was home and said, I said, we have to do whatever it takes to acquire this particular player. He was one of the leading scorers in our league. He had run into some problems with his team. His team wasn't a competitive team. So he was the most, um, he was the asset at the trade deadline, the most valuable asset the teams were fighting over, including Castleman. And we were we had we weren't we were a good team, but we had we had trouble scoring goals. Um, we did still have some weaknesses that would be exposed by Castleman and other great teams. So I'll never forget. I I worked for two days endlessly, and I said, I don't care whatever it takes. Whatever it takes was my new um, 
mantra for, for my general manager. I don't give a shit what it takes. By the time I get home, I want Ty Power on our team. He was the player that we wanted. It was high risk, high reward. He was a player with uh, junior A skills, but if we couldn't get him to buy into our program, if we couldn't turn him around off the ice, he had had issues off the ice, on the ice, if we couldn't turn him around and get him to buy in, he reminded me of Randy Moss in, uh, in New England. It, just super skilled next level, but if we couldn't get him to buy in and defend and play defense and buy into what we're doing, it would actually destroy the team. So I went all in that day. I burned the boats and we took the island. I said, when I get home, I want him part of our team. Bill called me back about 17 times over the next two days. And finally he said, we got the deal done. But the 17 phone calls were about, they want this player, this player, this player, this draft pick, this prospect. They wanted four blue chip prospects for a player that would play for us for four months because he was a graduate. He was going to graduate at age 21. So he was a complete rental. He would, we would rent his abilities for three to four months. And I said, I'll never forget it. I said, I don't care, whatever it takes. I said, we'll deal with next year. Next year, these prospects are not on our team. They're not, they're not having an impact. They're not helping us win. That's all in the future. We need to win now. We need to burn the ships. We need to take the island. We cannot take the island with 16-year-old players. We need to take the island with the, pe the men that give us the best chance to win. We made that trade. It cost us four blue chip prospects. Two of those blue chip prospects never played anymore. They went to university or college. That's the thing. It's like baseball draft picks. Most of them don't even pan out. And we sent some money and Ty Power was on the practice ice when I got there. He scored. Uh, he was the MVP of the playoffs when we defeated Ottawa in that year for the Barkley Cup. He was the MVP of the playoffs, the leading scorer of the playoffs. And after a very rough, turbulent start with yours relentless at the beginning, he became all in. That's a story for another day. I literally sent his ass home. I graduated him myself. He came back. He said, coach, I'll do whatever it takes to put a ring on my finger. And that's how that turned around. He was the playoff MVP, the playoff leading scorer. And uh, it all worked out because we burned the boats. There was no plan B. There was no plan B. We won the championship that year against the powerhouse Ottawa Canadians who, set, who had only lost four games the whole year. We beat them in five games in the final. And we also added some other players at the trade deadline. We went with six 20-year-old defensemen, which was unheard of. Hi, sweetheart. Are you ready to go to school? Okay. Head on up. I'll only be two minutes. You, could, you can stay there or go to the truck. I'm going to finish this up. Okay, I'll be right in. My magic. Um, and that's how that ended. We lifted a cup four months later. Um, against the Ottawa Canadians who beat out the Castleman Vikings. And hey, I love that. I love your new hat. This is my magic. I'll be up in a second, okay? So that's the story of me learning that there's certain things in life, not everything. There's certain things in life where you can't have a plan B. Family, yes. Business, yes. But sometimes you got to burn the boats, burn the ships to take the island. And that's what I learned. And like my dad said, if you're not in all in all, in all the way, if you're not going to burn the ships, if, you're, if you've got a plan B when you're competing against someone who doesn't, you have no chance to win. So that's the message for today. If you're having a, if you're having a, t uh, a hard time struggling with inspiration or motivation or getting a job done, maybe it's time to scrap the plan B. You can always have a plan B later on, but to literally go all in, all the way, burn the ships, burn the boats, and finally take that island. Speaking about burning the ships and burning the boats, is 2023 going to be any different for you? Is it going to be a year where you scale your business from five to six to seven, your income to a million dollars? Or is it just going to be more of the same? Frustration, quiet desperation, I got a brand new mastermind, newworldbuildersmastermind.com. It's badassworldbuilders.com. You go there, 
five questions, pay a $97 deposit, you get it back. I see whether you fit in and within seven days, you're either in or you're out. It's 12 month mastermind online, no travel, no hotels, no restaurants, just me and 49 other brothers. Marketing, marriage, money, physical health, mental health, uh, relationships with your kids, your grandkids, copywriting, email copywriting, you name it, I'm going to cover it all in the next year. Badassworldbuilders.com. Badassworldbuilders.com. Apply today. Spaces are filling up. That's it. Remember to hug your wife and children. Tell them how much they mean to you. Nothing is more important. The greatest gifts in our lives are right in our front, in front of us. Be present. Tell them every day how much you love them, how much you are there to protect them. They need to know that the king is looking out for them. Two words that changed my life. Two words that'll change your life. Be relentless.